start. My name is Michal Barabuzrad. I'm from Israel, from Photo Israel team. Uh, I would like to uh, uh, start this uh, uh, special uh, evening, special uh, event with uh, just a few words about uh, uh, the festival. Uh, so thank you for joining us for, for this session as part of the online event program at the Photo Israel International Photography Festival. Photo Israel is a non-profit organization established in Israel in 2012 to realize our social visit, vision of creating a better society through the language of photography, social activity, and creating a dialogue between arts and different communities in Israel. We believe that photography is a universal language that reaches across all cultures and genders to be understood by all, a language that allows for building bridges between central and remote areas and between unprivileged communities and the general public. The, uh, this session will be about taking pictures, transforming the world, organizations from around the world, promoting social change through photography. We have uh, uh, this evening uh, four speakers from three different organizations. Um, and uh, I would like uh, uh, first uh, uh, to uh, introduce our first speaker uh, from um, uh, PH15 organization, Miriam Priotti and Moira Rubio Brennan. They are co-directors of PH15 Foundation, um, a nonprofit NGO formed by a group of people who believe that art is a valuable resource, allowing humankind to deploy its essence and develop its creative ability, especially in a hostile reality. So I would like to uh, introduce you and uh, please, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Um, well, at first I wanna thank you all for this invitation. We really love to be here with, with all you guys. Uh, I will start describing a little bit what PH15 does and afterwards Miriam will, will continue. PH15, it's an NGO that believes in arts as a social, as a tool for social change. And it began in, in 2000 from uh, the, the desire of a group of kids and teenagers in, who lived in, in a slum in Buenos Aires. They, they desired to express themselves through photography. Uh, the, the slum where they lived, it's called the Hidden City, Ciudad Oculta. And uh, it's, there, there are more than 45,000 inhabitants in, in that neighborhood, all under the, the the line of poverty uh, since that's why we, we are called PH15 I wanted to, to tell because Ciudad Oculta the hidden city is the the slum number 15 in Buenos Aires the slums have different numbers so PH15 is, is the name because it it's hard is in in this neighborhood but since 2000 we have teach photography from for more than 4,000 thousand yeah people are all around Argentina in in different communities in one 150 communities in Argentina and the productions the photos uh, have been shown breaking barriers and prejudices all over the world in more than 400 places galleries museums and and different places of exhibitions always with the, with the idea of them to to use photography as as a, as a language to express and, and share the stories with the rest of the society that usually doesn't want to know what these kids have to tell and and, and what they think and decide so now Miriam it's up to you <laughs> Yes, hello everybody. Thank you for, for the invitation. As my English is not so great, I'm going to do a lecture and I'm going to share some images with you too. Taking pictures has become easier, but those photos that we constantly take have the power to tell us a story, to show us any feeling, to help us to understand. 
We believe that not always. Wherever when that happens, when the picture tells us a story, the photograph becomes more than an isolated frame. It becomes the gateway to another world, much deeper, which like a game of mirrors, allows us to look at ourselves, but with different eyes. In PH15, we believe in the power of the stories that we are able to tell when we connect with ourselves. Once, Moira and I, we were, we were photographers too. And in a way, we still are, but not like before. And this, without a doubt, is a choice. If I ever wanted to be a photographer, it was because I believe in art and its power to change the world. And if I ever decide to stop being it, it was because I understood that art can be something more than individual artists producing work. PH15 is an artistic event that transcends individual work. The creative force is put into play in each of the activities, accompanying the evolution of a collective process that expands beyond the development of the workshop. In each experience, new territories are born while others emerge on the surface and begin to challenge us with their presence. Thinking arts from a social organization confront us with daily dilemmas, but it also challenges us to think and do from a new place. It places us on the margin, but it is precisely that border where we frequently walk that drive us to link fields that are often disjoint. As an experienced photographer does, PH15 allows us to, challenge, to change lenses, modify filters, and adjust measurements according to the needs of the precious moment. In those list us to make each other practice, each practice unique, to tell us its own story, to expand before us, and to invite us to look beyond that reality that limits us as possible. Now we will share two of the thousand stories that are inscribed in this sense as micro revolutions of everyday doing, which drive us to continue working with the confidence that art still has much to offer as a tool for change. It was 2003 and Natalia was glad that it was not longer, longer raining. She left her house looked for her friends, and they hung around, enjoying the, la the late afternoon hours. She and her mate has brought their cameras. They were participating at that time at the photography workshop that PH15 held every Saturday in their community of Ciudad Oculta, one of the most vulnerable neighborhoods in the city of Buenos Aires. Taking photos was very natural for them. And what happened after that the rain adds an interesting nuance of tones and textures. Without imagining it, that day Natalia took the photo that she will remember the most in, in her career as an artist, a perfect reflection that recalls a great masterpiece piece of plastic. This is the picture. One of the most frequent strategies at PH15 that, uh, that PH15 uses to make visible the work produced by the participant of its workshops is, is to organize photographic exhib exhibitions in different areas. This is how museums, cultural centers, places in schools, and many other institutions become spaces that temporarily host PH15 students' photo photograph to be shared with different members of the community. On one occasion, one of these exhibitions was held in the Golden Room of the Buenos Aires City Hall Congress. Natalia had the opportunity to exhibit her latest production, that reflection. At the time of the inauguration, many people approached her to comment on her photo, but something in this set, in this set of an alarm. Many of those of, uh, who commented on her photo were deputies from Buenos Aires, the people who decide the fate of the city's laws. 
and they all hold her more or less the same thing. What a beautiful image. As it often is the case in these events, a moment of the opening was devoted to the opening speeches. Natalia then asked us to be the one who spoke on behalf of Peace Kinsey on that occasion. She took the microphone and very decisively began to speak directly to the deputies present there. She greatly appreciate, appreciate the comments on her photo, which had been extremely flattering, but she told them that was what she hoped by showing that photograph up there was that they could understand what happens in her neighborhood every time it rains. The flooding in the street and corridors made the community impassable. No one could enter or leave their own houses and the water took several days to withdraw. She also explained that she was capable to taking beautiful photos in other contexts and that she did not need that disaster to happen to produce beautiful photos. In a firm and convinced tone, she urged them to action. This is Natalia nowadays. No one could remain indifferent on that speech. Many of us were happy about what was happening. Others began to feel somewhat uncomfortable about the situation. The most interesting thing about this whole episode in the step Natal is the step Natalia managed to take that day. She became aware to her whole role as an artist and there soon that her work speaks for her and that many times they do so from a deeper place than words. Being an artist turned her into someone who can not only transform her own experience at, and of her neighborhood, but also the gaze of others about the community and her daily reality. Democratizing access to art is a concept that has been debated for a long time. In recent years, many spaces in which art is exhibited have ceased to be elite spaces and have gradually become accessible institutions for wider audiences. But what about the artists? Throughout more than 20 years of work, we have noticed that in each sample of Peace Kinse photograph, the same dynamic is repeated. When people go for the first time, they cannot get into their head the idea that the photography they are observing are taken by girls, boys, or adolescents living in vulnerable situations. It, it does not coincide with the social imaginary about the figure of the artist that these subjects are creators or, pot or potential creators of works of art. It involves a long journey to make that part of the public aware of the authorship of the photograph and to understand the process of creating the works that they are observing. In 2007, some of this logic was broken. The prestigious Ruth Ben Sakar Art Gallery in the city of Buenos Aires then launched the sixth edition of the Curriculum Zero contest. Carlos, one of the participants in the PH15 workshop wanted to take part on the contest. He knew that it could be not easy to be select. In previous editions, artists who had been chosen, although they had short careers, were powerful references of, for, of a young generation that was ganging presence in the world of Buenos Aires art. Added to this, the winners of the previous editions averaged 22 years old when Carlos was just 14, 14. What was interesting about the contest was the form of participation. The works were presented in an envelope seen with a pseudonym. The real data of the artist was only released after the jury's vote. With this picture, Carlos managed to be selected and set a record. He is on these days the youngest artist to have won the competition, but also, and this is already off the records, he is also the only artist in this community to be awarded in such contests. This is Carlos nowadays. On that occasion, Carlos was able to make visible not only the images captured in his photograph, but also the symbolic and material barriers that can be destroyed throughout a work of art. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much uh, for the presentation. We will have a Q&A session, a short one at the end. Uh, so if our participants have questions, please write them in the Q&A. Um, and we will uh, skip directly to our next uh, uh, speaker. Uh, I would like to present uh, Shannon Elder, the managing editor and designer of Native Agency. Shannon's work lies at the intersection of the political, the creative, and the humane. She focuses her advocacy on issues related to race, immigration, and ethical representation in media. She is currently working as the managing editor and designer at Native Agency, an organization diversifying documentary photography and the journalism industry. So Shannon, um, we are really eager to hear you. Thank you, thank, thank you. you so much. Um, thank you. Hello, everyone. I wanted to send a little thank you to you all for welcoming us at Native here today. We're very happy to join you. Let's see, I'll just get my presentation going here. All right. So, um, so yes, I'm representing Native today here. Um, who is Native? So, Native is a team of five photographers, writers, and designers. We're a photo-led organization passionate about the power of the image. Um, and we work primarily with image makers to build stories from still photography. The entire existence of our organization is based on the notion that we ought to be engines of change in perspectives of who tells visual stories. So who gets to cover the world and how they cover it. So why we exist. So the journalism and documentary industry have deep uh, issues and struggle a lot with diversity and representation. Native is seeking to change visual journalism to be represent representative of diverse talent from across the globe. So we do that by elevating the work of image makers from underrepresented regions, um, working mostly with folks in Latin America, Africa, and Asia. Our work is really geared towards informing and nurturing photographers um, by helping them navigate the documentary industry and building a collective community with one another. Let's see. It's not letting me. Oh, there we go. Okay. So our storytellers. So we have around 65 photographers that are part of our storytelling database, and they're from 35 countries from around the world. Native photographers are active participants. They build relationships with a diverse community of international creators. Um, we talk through pitches. We talk about questions or concerns that are coming up with the industry. Um, we participate in group discussions. We have ex exhibitions. Um, we put together publications, other projects as a group. And so, like I said, we, we do some workshops, exhibitions, and creative labs. These are an opportunity to celebrate local, regional, and international visual heritage and learn how to break away from established colonial gazes while learning how to tell personal visual stories effectively. Um, we've previously held events in Germany, in Kenya, Nigeria, and Ecuador. Uh, mentorship. So, we offer mentees a cost-free two-year learning opportunity to develop skills that will help them foster a unique visual language and build their career with the ultimate goal of helping create an industry that more accurately reflects the diversity of the world. So diversity and representation. So we really believe that to accurately share narratives that promote social and political change, we must be viewing and reflecting the world through diverse perspectives. Um, so as democracy is increasingly threatened, journalism has to become an effective tool for responsible storytelling. And this can only be done if representation in the global media industry corresponds with the diversity of the global um, life. And it's our responsibility to be aware of the lack of representation in media and find solutions to fill the diversity gap and make sure that localized underrepresented voices are made just as loud as international organizations. Oops. 
All right, so race and photography. So there's a lot here um, that could be a whole nother conversation, but it is important. And I think we approach our work very much in acknowledging that photography began as a colonial tool to justify racism. It justified opp oppression, colonialism, slavery, segregation. It's still a colonial tool in many ways. Um, and it enabled a racist index view of the world. Um, it created this sense of other, right? and how that culture of amusement has been replaced by mass media. So now photography has this opportunity to reinvent itself and its role, placing contemporary artists in the position where they can make race incoherent. So it's essential to be aware of the power dynamic that is created by the camera um, and to offset that power dynamic. So critical consumption. So there's a responsibility of the viewer to be critical of how stories are portrayed, the ethics that are involved and whose benefit it might be to have a story told in a specific way. There's a triangle relationship between the subject, the photographer and the audience and each part has a, re has a responsibility. Um, and then beyond that, it's also um, especially worth noting that editors have a responsibility to use their power in choosing photographers um, to really think about why and how they choose different photographers for certain stories. So things to consider. So um, does the subject of your story have agency to participate, right? So do you have translators? Are you able to act, ad, adequately communicate with somebody, right? Um, also, does the story in the captions, the text of the story have sufficient context about the person, about their situation, about all of the things that are happening around what it is that you're specifically trying to tell? And also, how can your work provide visibility, but responsibly, right? for underrepresented regions and communities to be seen more so, right? So um, to sort of build on that last point, um, we can't really talk about the role of photography in social change without examining our own practices, our own biases, right? Like we all have biases, it's just inherent. Um, and how we're inclusive or exclusive of others, whether that's consciously or subconsciously. Um, so this, so for example, today, this is a, a international photography festival in Israel. How are those, are other communities being seen in this event today and through the other things that you'll um, experience as part of the festival? Um, and we at Native want to understand sort of what is, we want to think about like, what is the role of the, the photographer based in Israel um, to engage in conversation and create meaningful change. So the role of the creator to engage in a conversation with someone say based in Palestine, um, there's a responsibility to have those dialogues. Um, and in not only this situation today, but in, in any situation that you engage in with photography to constantly have these questions of which perspectives are presented, which perspectives are missing, um, and to think about that, not only in this panel, but in the festival, in your work um, and everything we do to constantly be checking ourselves and think about how can we be agents of change to shift that? And when we notice that there's a difference, when there's somebody missing, how can we um, make sure that those voices are heard? Um, and yeah, just making sure that we, va we create spaces that value um, different perspectives, which is critical um, to having conversations and making change. And then. Perfect, thank you very, very much. It was uh, very interesting. And I felt like uh, uh, the Q&A was uh, also uh, at the end of your uh, um, presentation, like questions that are related to what's going on in Israel. Uh, and of course we would love to elaborate if we'll have time at the end. Uh, but it, um, many of the things that you mentioned are, are on our uh, mind. Uh, so um, yeah, if we'll have time, we would love to discuss that as well, what's going on in Israel and in uh, the International Photography Festival now in Tel Aviv as well. 
Uh, but I don't want to steal the time for Glenn, which is uh, waiting uh, patiently for uh, being our next speaker. So thank you, Shannon. And I would like to uh, present uh, um, Glenn Ruga, founder and director uh, of the Social Documentary Network and executive editor of Zeke magazine. Uh, Glenn Ruga, SDN founder, is a graphic designer, a part-time social documentarian, and a lifelong human rights activist from 2010 till 2013. He was the executive director of the Photographic Resource Center at Boston University. So I would love to uh, present Glenn. Uh, go ahead, thank you very much. Well, thank you. Um, thank you, McCall and, and Ball and all of Photo Israel for inviting me and SDN to be here today. Um, I wish I could see all of you out there. Um, it'd be nice to see all the faces, but under these conditions, we just can't. And I also really want to uh, thank um, Miriam, Moira, and Shannon. It's great to be on the stage with them. And uh, Shannon, that last presentation you did was just fantastic. Thank you. I'd like to talk briefly about the social documentary network web platform and our print magazine, Zeke, um, which supports efforts by documentary photographers to make meaningful change in the world. And let me start with some background, but um, let me share my screen now. Okay. Uh, SDN began in 2008 as a web platform for global documentary photography. And since that time, we've presented more than 3,500 exhibits on our website by greater than 2,500 photographers from all parts of the world on very diverse themes, often about challenging situations and about marginalized people. In today's presentation, I'm going to mostly talk about the advocacy exhibits on the SDN website and in Zeek, although there are many other um, types of projects as well. The website is an open platform where any photographer can create and submit an online exhibit, including you out there. If you're doing documentary photography work, uh, we encourage you to uh, use the SDN platform as a way to get your work out there to the public, to the world. And um, exhibits must be approved before going live, but greater than 95% 95 95 of all exhibits are approved. And often when they're not, it's just because they're, they're not actually documentary projects. And let me start by showing you a standard exhibit on the SDN website. This one is by Ed Kashi, a photographer uh, you may know of. And right now I'm just going to talk more about the SDN website and then I'll talk more about this exhibit in a little while. All, ex all exhibits on the SDN website must have a minimum of six images. Um, Ed has nine and some photographers have many, many more. But the point is that for us, it's never about the individual image. It's about um, a collection of images to tell a story. And then it's also important for there to be information text about uh, what is going on. Uh, we refer to it as an exhibit abstract and then also captions for each image. And this is required for all exhibits on SDN. And then there are opportunities for photographers to put in additional information um, as they see fit, um, credits, affiliated NGOs, um, contact information. Here we have an interview with Ed. And all photographers can also have a profile page on the SDN website. This is Ed's profile page, which shows all of his live exhibits on the site and a little bit of biographical information. Um, it's free to post an exhibit on the SDN website for one year. And after that, there's a fee to renew the exhibits. And once an exhibit is live, we may feature it in our email spotlight and in our social media. Um, and we feature all the work of, um, or most of the work on the SDN homepage, which I haven't even showed yet. So let me show you the homepage. Uh, this is the homepage right now today. If you went to the website, um, the main featured exhibits are in the central area and you can click through these. Uh, this man is ecstatic because of the results of the presidential elections on Saturday. Um, and if we just click into any one of these, we'll go into um, the more detail about these projects. And then in 2015, we started publishing Zeke, a print and, and digital magazine presenting the best work from the SDN website. And unlike the website, we have a very heavy hand with the content of the magazine. 
we edit the photography and text very carefully and assign writers to expand on the photographic stories that began with the photographers. So this is the current issue of Zeke magazine uh, that's available now, both in print and digital. The digital is um, identical to what the print is. And this is a typical story in the magazine. Um, so whereas the SDN website pretty much leaves things up to the photographers for editing the text, I mean, editing the images and the text, the magazine, on the other hand, um, we bring in writers um, and journalists to, to write more extensive information. So after we get through the photographs, um, then we often have an article or an essay um, in this case. So, so this project is about the um, Peruvian Amazon rainforest and the indigenous communities there and how their lives are being impacted by industrialization, uh, mining, uh, foresting. And so, so this article wrote this more in-depth, uh, this uh, journalist wrote this more in-depth article about these issues. So that's what the magazine allows us to do, which is different than the website. And I'm very happy to announce that this year, SDN just became a nonprofit organization. Um, th this is something we've been working on for a long time. So we're, we're now an official nonprofit organization registered here in the United States. And what makes SDN and Zeke unique is that all the work is driven by the passions and interests of the photographer. We, we never assign a project. The work exists because the photographer on their own goes out and creates it. And this is quite unlike traditional concept of journalism where the work is assigned and edited by others. And this is often the greatest difference between journalism and documentary from, from our perspective. So let's look at some specific projects first on the SDN website and, and then on Zeke magazine. And um, so today, again, I'm really focusing on projects that are more advocacy driven. So Ed Kashi has been working on this project for many years about um, chronic kidney disease of unknown origin or CKDU. Um, it's a project that he started himself um, a decade ago and is still working on and has been exploring um, this disease and its effect on farm workers throughout Latin America. Um, it's off, well, scientists don't know exactly the cause of it, but there's a lot of indications that it's due to um, very difficult working conditions, dehydration, and also toxic chemicals that are used um, in the agricultural process. And then it provides uh, links here to NGOs that are working specifically on this issue and viewers to this site can learn more about the issue or can contribute to these NGOs if they would like. This next project is by Catherine Carnow called Agent Orange, A Terrible Legacy and uh, generations following the US war in Vietnam, uh, children today are being born um, with these deformative diseases as a result of genetic defects caused by Agent Orange which was used by the US military as a defoliant so they could um, destroy all the um, forest cover and therefore make um, it easier for them to run bombing missions. But now it's um, affecting children there generations later. And Catherine again works with um, NGOs on this project and you can learn more about them here. You can learn quite a bit just on, on the website itself. Um, she, pro she, she provides very extensive captions for each of her images, um, talking about um, you know, specifics of what we're looking at. And we really encourage photographers to provide that information. And it's usually what distinguishes the more successful projects um, because they do provide that information. This next project is by Mathilde Simus, a uh, photographer here in Massachusetts where I live. Uh, she focuses on human trafficking and this particular project is about human trafficking in Kenya and about teaching uh, young girls there how to be aware of it and um, how to avoid it. And again, uh, not only does she work with an NGO 
in Kenya called Heart Kenya, but she's actually started her own NGO to work on this issue. And um, you know, she, she works in other countries and quite a bit in the US as well, where human trafficking is, is a tremendous problem here as well. And the photographer Matilda Simons travels all over the country talking about, talking about her work, but really to bring awareness to the issue, um, to gain greater support for people trying to overcome human trafficking. This project by British photographer is called Transplants in the Gaza Strip. And it's about um, British volunteer doctors with an NGO who go to Gaza to do um, kidney transplants. And the work is all about this NGO that does the work. Here's a, a little girl in Gaza um, in dialysis the night before her surgery. And again, you can learn more about um, the NGO he works with on the website here. So th uh, this next project I wanna show is a little bit different because it's not really advocacy driven, but it's very typical of much of the work on the SDN website, which is more in the fine art vein um, in street photography. And this German photographer, Marcus Dreas, I did this project called Israel and Palestine, where it's just these extraordinarily beautiful and powerful photographs exploring um, Palestinians and Israelis um, in Israel. This exhibit is probably about five years old. It's, it's not the most current one on the website, but I, I can't imagine things have changed dramatically, drastically within the last five years. Um, this is a photograph to an entrance to a mosque during prayer time. Uh, this is a Nobilis uh, antique store, old town of Jerusalem. Uh, the separation wall, members of the Israeli IDF, a bar mitzvah at the Western Wall. And then a Palestinian prisoner who is released by Israel after 21 years in jail is welcomed back to his village in Nabi Saleh, West Bank. And now let's go to the magazine. Um, this is published twice a year. We're now working on our 13th issue, I believe right now. And um, this is this article that we just looked at from the last issue. So actually, let, let me move ahead because we already looked at that one. This is an article by a uh, British photographer, Carol Allen Story about um, teenage pregnancy in Rwanda. And Carol works very extensively with um, NGOs, mostly British NGOs working in Africa um, and often in Rwanda. These are just these incredibly powerful and beautiful photographs of um, teenage mo mothers. And what Carol does, and that we really like to see, is that her captions are really just straight interviews with the subjects. So to give the subjects um, of the photographs a, a direct voice, you know, they're identified by name, um, and then we can hear them directly rather than uh, intervention by a writer talking about the subject, we get to hear directly from the subject. Um, this woman, Florence, starts saying, I became pregnant when I was 15 in a rush of passion with my boyfriend. I then thought about the fate of my life. I was not prepared for parenting. I lost hope. I told my boyfriend, he said he would support me, but soon after he vanished. And I, I feel these photographs demonstrate very well the power of the photographic image to um, portray important issues um, by bringing people into these images. It's, it's very hard to just look at these images and just keep clicking because they just are so beautiful. 
so powerful. This exhibit is from a special issue of Zeke that we did a few years ago on Roma and Travelers. Um, and, and this um, article within that issue is called Roma Rising. It's by photographer Chad Evans Wyatt and his partner, Mary Evelyn Porter, who is a writer. And they travel around the world photographing successful Roma, uh, Roma who have done um, well in arts, business, medicine, entertainment. And like Carol Allen's story that we saw a minute ago, um, they often provide um, opportunity for them to talk directly through the captions. And, and the power of this exhibit is really to overcome this stereotype that so many people have of Roma. Um, you know, the Roma are the most discriminated people in, in Europe today. Um, very difficult conditions, but um, this article allows us to realize that there's another view of Roma, a more real view. And let me just click through the rest of the magazine here now of, of this issue. Um, we had an article, a history of the Romani people, giving us background of who the Roma are, where they came from. And here's an, another article on Irish travelers, a very similar situation to Roma, a little bit different background, but conditions are very similar. Actually, I believe this is an Israeli photographer. I'm not sure if anybody's familiar with her, Ruti Alan, but she's done these extraordinarily beautiful photographs from Romania of the Roma community there. And I think that just leaves us another 15 minutes. So I'll um, end my presentation now and look forward to going into the Q&A session. Thank you very much, Glenn. Uh, it was very interesting and uh, the different uh, subjects, very wide range, uh, wonderful. Thank you. Um, if uh, there are questions from the audience, that's the time to write it on the Q&A. Uh, but I uh, already have three questions that I would uh, like to uh, ask our uh, um, speakers. Uh, and I will, would like to ask the question and uh, let you answer by the uh, order of your uh, talks. So uh, first we'll answer uh, Moira and Miriam and then Shannon and uh, then Glenn. So the first question is, uh, do you think photography is an effective media for social change? And if so, why? So Moira and Miriam, you're first. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, yes. <laughs> yes, we really think it is, of course. That's why we have been working hard on this uh, for the last 20 years. Uh, and it has to do because uh, in, in the time we, we do more um, workshops and we have more kids involved on the practices, we can see how their, their pictures allow them to talk about the things they cannot talk with words and how the, the photography is a bridge for them with, with themselves, with their the partners on the group, but also with their communities and and with the and with the whole community where they live. Yes, of course, we believe in art as a tool for social change. Yes. Any any discipline of art, but during these years, the testimonies of of the participants who have have graduated already show us that that they their, their lives have been changed through through their through their path through through PH15 and and they have and they realized that that it, it had changed the way they re, they relate with others and and this is something that that I, I mean we, we we they are not all photographers but they they realize that they they face their lives in a very different way and and they they fight for their rights differently as citizens empowered citizens. Thank you. Shannon, 
can you yeah like, yeah jump in absolutely it absolutely is a method for social change I think that um I mean I think photography is a method in which we can share things that are not always seen. Um, and I think that that is a beautiful way to connect art with change, to be able to shift narratives and to shift perspectives of how people think about the world and other people around them. It, well, I'm not sure if this is the right group of people to ask this question of. Of course, we all believe that photography is a means of social change. And that's why we're doing the work that we do. Um, why? Well, I mean, let's just look at some images in history. Most recently here in the United States, the murder of George Floyd by a Minneapolis policeman um, changed everything in this country overnight. Um, it was a grainy, poorly shot video. It doesn't matter though, but it, it showed us some truth. Um, there's the photograph of Elan Kurti, the, the young, um, Syrian boy who died on the Turkish coast during the massive migrations, which changed policy throughout the world about immigration policy. Uh, there were photographs from the Vietnam War that really um, launched massive protests against the wars. So clearly there's much evidence about how photography is a powerful medium for social change. It is very interesting because all your uh, answers were yes, but from a totally different perspective, which is uh, why this meeting is uh, so interesting to me. And that leads me to my second question. Uh, you three represent different platforms for social activism through photography. Why did you choose this specific platform, a magazine, an agency, and so on? So uh, Miriam and Moira, you're first. Well, in our case, the platform chose us <laughs> because uh, we start doing this work in Pitch 15 because a group of uh, children from Ciudad Oculta in, in a slum of Buenos Aires was, was they, they were start to, to, to look in for the way to have photographic classes uh, and they couldn't because it was so expensive for them in the year 2000, the, the cameras were all professionals. It was not the access to cameras that nowadays we have. Uh, and Argentina, once more, was uh, passing through, uh, through a big, big crisis. Uh, now we are also in a big crisis, but in that time it was. And with Moya and other photographers, we decided to, to, to act. We decided to start to, to, to teach these kids photography. But in that moment, we didn't imagine the, the perspective of, of the project. We, we, we couldn't imagine in that moment that it was going to grow and how, how important it could be for them. Thank you very much. <laughs> Moira, uh, do you have something to add before Shannon is uh... No, actually, no. The thing is, when, when I actually started teaching in PH15, it was a, a little bit selfish of me because I wanted to learn from them <laughs> to take the pictures as, as they did because they have a, a very spontaneous look and their images had something that it was very inno innovative for me and they were full of, of, of power and I wanted to learn from them so it was like an exchange it, it it's it's something that the transformation is both sides. and and yes I, I agree with Miriam that that it's something that chose us and it was not was not it was something it wasn't it wasn't planned actually thank you Shannon please Yes. Yeah. Happy you jumped in there. I was going to double check that you didn't have anything else to say. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I think it's important to note that like we're not a traditional agency, right? So we don't represent people. We help people represent themselves because we think that's a really powerful, important thing um, for people to be able to do. So I think for me, why I wanted to work at Native is because um, there's a lot of power in community and really a lot of what we do centers around community and oftentimes photographers are very isolated and don't have that ability to like connect with each other or to connect with people who are doing the same work um, in a different continent, right? Um, so I think the community part is, is huge. Glenn? 
Yeah, I, I would second what Miriam and Moira said that um, it chose me rather than I chose uh, this medium. Um, I have always been involved in the visual arts and um, I'm just using the tools and the proclivities that I have to make change in the world. It, it just was a natural transition from other things I was doing before this to um, be using photography and visual imagery to be making the change. Okay, uh, I see that we have, uh, before I uh, conclude with the uh, third, oh, uh, before I conclude with the third uh, question, I see uh, some uh, people asking questions. The first one is for Shannon. Could you explain the meaning of the sentence, does the subject have the agency to participate? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so obviously there's certain scenarios in which things happen very quickly and you don't always have the time to like take as much care with a story as you might be able to, especially if it's a fast moving situation. But I think where I come from with that is, um, for example, there's the really iconic National Geographic photo, the Afghan girl, and she was underage. She was never given a name and she also didn't know she was on the cover of National Geographic for a very long time. So I think sort of just thinking about um, is who you're photographing a minor? What consequences does that have? Can you communicate with somebody? Are they willing to participate? Um, that's that type of thing. Um, yeah, and also being mindful of that power dynamic. Hopefully that answers your question. Okay, thank you, I think so. Uh, I see people are still writing, so I will ask my third question and then I'll jump back to uh, uh, our crowd here. So um, my third, third question is, how does the COVID-19 pandemic uh, affects your work and, and agendas? If so, and uh, how? It, it affected completely because nowadays we cannot go to the neighborhoods. We are than it is and cannot go there. So we have to become virtual and do access to technology and, and it's it's very, very difficult to to keep connected with, with the students. But still we, we managed to to make like um, a register of, of the of the pandemic of the quarantine, I don't know how you call it, the, the isolation, the, the lockdown, <laughs> sorry. So, so the, the, all the participants have, have been taking photographs of, of their, their own uh, view of, of this situation. And we, have, we had an, an Instagram account with, with these pictures and we share them with, with everybody. Uh, but it's it's really hard. It's not the same in our work. It, it has to do a lot with, with physical contact. We, we, we like to meet with, uh, with the students and debate in a, in a very horizontal way in a table. And so it's really, really, really hard. Did, did, you, did you do Zoom or something in your activity? Do you do your so, social activities through Zoom now with the... the... Uh, yes, we have a different strategies. It's by Zoom. It's also by WhatsApp. Uh, we are trying to use the platform that the, the, the students are allowed to use. Sometimes we are doing a Zoom and some other people is in a, in a WhatsApp and, and the teacher puts him like mm -hmm. this. It, uh, here in Argentina, the, the connectivity, is, it's a hard point because uh, we, we, uh, we are a really poor country with a lot of people under the poor line and the access to, to connections and to technology is, is not equal for all. Um, and the un, uh, underserved po uh, populations uh, have the, the, the less uh, connectivity. Um, and in the other way, they are the ones that need it more because uh, they need to attend to school, they need to, ascend, to attend to their, the, to their activities and they cannot do that. Uh, but we still we still trying because uh, we think that uh, in the other hand it is the the biggest moment to be present and to try to 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 keep there the art as a tool for there to express because as we are all in the lockdown 
there are no places to talk. There are no places to, to express their, their problems or the things they want to, to tell. So it, it, it has these two, two issues. It is too difficult or is the moment we need it most. Sorry about my English. <laughs> no, no, uh, we, uh, we totally understand. We feel the okay. same. We work with uh, communities here in Israel in a, in a similar, uh, from what I understand from your presentation, in a similar format. And uh, we feel uh, also that it's a uh, high time to do it and it's harder to do, but even more, more important. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. So Shannon, please. Yeah, um, I think the biggest impact that the pandemic has had on our work is really on our storytellers to be able to find work for themselves. I think that's the biggest thing. It's just a very challenging time for lots of folks. Um, but in terms of Native itself, we do have the benefit that we've been we're, in, we're international. So we had like our meetings and things were always online for to begin with. So that was nice. But I do think that our workshops have taken, they've, we've kind of had to put things on pause and reimagine how to do things online, um, which takes away the beauty of meeting and pe like meeting people human to human, you know, but we've found ways to make it work, so. Well, it's, um, it's affected how we work because it's affected how photographers all over the world work. And I think the best way for me to answer that is to share my screen. I just want to show you a special section in Zeke magazine um, that's in the current issue. And we had a call for work from around the world on the pandemic. And we exceed, uh, received an extraordinary amount of work from all over. And let me just share some of this with you. And the upper left is from Iran and the upper right is from Bangladesh. Upper left is from Hungary. On the lower right is United States. Um, there's Italy here, um, Nepal, um, Bangladesh again, United States. Up in the upper right is Veracruz, Mexico. Uh, lower left is um, Mexico again. Upper right is Mexico. So yeah, I mean, photographers had to find different ways to work and we were very fortunate and happy to be able to find, to have a platform to, um, for them to do that. In terms of our day-to-day -day work, actually it hasn't changed much because we're primarily, um, photography is a media that exists digitally. So um, everybody's able to transfer files around the world. We can still have our magazine printed. Um, given that we have a print magazine that's mailed and the mail system is still working, fortunately, we can still mail our magazine. Um, so we're adapting the best we can. I think the hardest thing right now are for photographers who have lost assignments all over the world because um, the events that they would photograph have, no longer exist. Um, it, it's a very ripe topic and we could talk about this for a long time, but I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. Okay, thank you very much. I have uh, two extra questions uh, from uh, people that are uh, with us, uh, although we can't uh, see them. So uh, the first question is very practical, uh, but also important. Uh, how do you finance your beautiful and so important initiatives? That's the, the worst part. Most <laughs> part. The most difficult part. Yes, we, we try to, to diverse our funding as much as possible. We, we have a very little funding from the city government. We have very little funds from, from different people who donate with our credit card monthly, a, a small amount of money. Um, the, the, the photos are for sale. It's very, it's, <laughs> we have a book that is for sale also that, that give us a little funding. Uh, we're always trying to have like the private sector, public sector and particular donors uh, to, to have like equal funding for, for the organization. But it's, it's we are always um, about to shut down our, the organization. It's a, we, we present in every, every grant that is, that it comes to an, our attention, we, we, we present a, a, a project. Uh, uh, but then, it's, it's really, really hard and it's getting harder uh, in this time also. 
the issue that we, we try to do is to manage it as a very small organization in the, in the structure but with a, big, a huge impact in the project. We try to give all the, the sources to the project, but also because when we have less contributors, as we have a, a small structure, it is possible to keep it alive, uh, even in the worst moments. Um, but, but, but here in Argentina, it is very difficult. And the other difficult difficulty is that uh, Art, pro, art and social projects, sometimes they are not the, the top of the, the, yeah, the project variety. that mm -hmm. someone could finance uh, uh, because it is not a, a first uh, need, but, but we, we, as we think it is, it is, we think it is a first need, but not the, the contributors. So it is too difficult to find the, 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 the finance. Thank you. Shannon? Yeah, I mean, we struggle with this too. I mean, it's a hard, it's a hard thing to make happen. Um, and we are always having conversations about this. I think for us, um, the majority of our funding comes via projects. So if we're doing a certain workshop, if we're doing a certain exhibition, the funding usually re revolves around a particular project for us. So. And for us, um, nobody's making a salary here. Um, some of us sometimes will we'll make uh, a fee for certain projects we're managing, but we all have other jobs. Um, my main source of income actually is graphic design work that I do. Um, but there's a lot of expenses, particularly in publishing a magazine and just operating a website like this. And there are fees that photographers pay that allow the website to continue. Um, we do get some subscription revenue. And, and then we get a lot of donations. And, you know, it's a mixture of all of the above. Uh, more recently, we started doing, we started doing teaching, which um, the whole Zoom thing has really allowed us to have uh, students from all over the world. And teaching has um, brought revenue into the organization. It's been very helpful. Okay, thank you. We're uh, uh, five minutes over time, but I have just one last uh, question, and we will finalize with this one from the audience. Uh, what do you think about the manipulation one can do on pictures these days, and how it can affect social change? What can we do to keep authenticity, and how do, you, do we deal with it? Uh, we particularly in, in PhD, I think we don't, we do not manage images. Uh, if the photographer wants to manage the image and 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 give it another sense, it, it's up to to the photographer. Of course, we believe that if we can, I mean, we can manage little things that don't affect what the story the story or what the the photographer wants to tell if 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 the managing changes the the meaning of the story of the photograph we we don't do it uh, but of course if, if if the photograph the photograph is going to be used somewhere else where we do not have the decision of course we 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 make a, a contract to so they they don't alter the, the meaning of the photograph. Shannon? Yeah, I would say that we're pretty much the same in that way. Um, we don't manipulate anything at all. It's all up to the photographer to leave their work as they want it to be. Um, so yeah, we don't do anything about that ourselves, but I would just say that like there are some, as long as it doesn't affect the way that the story is told in the, I think that it can be an effective method for sure. I think it just depends on the creator and what they're trying to do with the story. Thank you. And Glenn? We certainly don't encourage it, but um, we, we can't control it either. Uh, it's, it's a very important discussion today. And we really can't accept the veracity of any photographic image we see today because of how easily it is manipulated. So really it comes down um, that rather than trusting the image, it's um, do we trust the photographer or do we trust the source of the image, whether it's a reputable news source or just somebody you don't know on the internet, that makes a huge difference. So we have to look beyond the image itself to understand if we could really trust what we're being shown. 
Thank you very much. Uh, I, uh, I really appreciate you joining us uh, this evening, also the participants and of course uh, the speakers. It was uh, very, very interesting, important, um, and um, I'm uh, really, um, I feel honored that you are uh, here with us. Um, I would like uh, to uh, give a special thanks to the Argentinian uh, Embassy if we're talking about support. So they are supporting this specific event. So I would uh, like to uh, uh, thank them. Uh, and uh, I would like also to tell all the participants that you are welcome to join uh, all our uh, other online events uh, as part of the festival. So feel free to register. It's all uh, free of charge and uh, open to the public and uh, thank you very much i hope uh, when everything uh, when the sky is open again i would love to invite you to israel and to the festival and to see what we're doing on our end uh with uh, these issues uh, the documentary uh, side the agency side and of course uh the um the part of the social activity through uh photography, and I feel uh, that our organization is uh, touching different subjects uh, that you are uh, related to in different ways, uh, but it's not my day to talk about ourselves. Uh, so thank you very, very much again, uh, and have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you all so much. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank and you. And thank you, everybody, for you. listening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.